On the afternoon of September 23rd, 1926, the body of a well-dressed man in a dark suit was found on the slopes of the Schneeberg, that's a mountain near Vienna. A pistol gripped in his right hand, even though he was left-handed. He had been shot once the left, through the left temple. A suicide note was on the body, and three others had been distributed to friends and relatives. All were typed, none were handwritten. Astonishingly, without further investigation, it was declared a suicide and the case was closed. This was Paul Kammerer, and this was the end of Lamarckian biology, because he was the last of the great proponents of Lamarckian biology. He had been one of the most famous scientists of the, of the early 20th century. His name was expunged from all the scientific biographies. If you go to look up Paul Kammerer to find out what he did in any kind of scientific institution, you will not find his name mentioned anywhere. He did something that was much, much more important, we believe, than uh, his work on biology. Kammerer wrote this book called Das Gesetz des Series, which means the law of seriality. This was quite an amazing book. Uh, never got out of German. It was published in 1919. And what it was, was the result of a lifetime of just observing things. Because uh, Paul Kammerer was an original 14. He just liked to notice odd things. And it didn't matter if it was terribly, wildly, seriously odd or just slightly odd. Three people dressed in an unu unusually unique way, and he would write that down noticed unusual number of people carrying packages on the bus that uh, didn't come from any place uh, where shopping was done. You write that down. You don't have to have uh, a spectacular fire in the sky for something weird to be happening. The weird's happening all around us. But after about 20 years of collecting this stuff, all these oddities, was start taking a biologist's method to categorizing them. And he categorized them in a very Linnaean kind of fashion. He had categories and subcategories and phylums and subphylums. He broke them into what he called series of events that seemed to be correlated, even though they might not immediately have a causal connection. He had simple series, power series, spatial or simultaneous series, dependent, collateral, hybrid, mixture, single role, multi role, parallel, polytomic, diverging, converging, correlation, segmental, bilateral, symmetrical. Equivalency, homology, analogy, row, crossing, inverse, opposition, contrast, alternating or exchange cycles, cyclical series, phasic series, periodic series, and so on. Uh, and he sort of concluded from this that there were things happening out there that were beyond what one would expect from a random distribution. And if that was the case, and he had them all classified, what would he propose to explain them? He says, quote, I do not want to be a victim of the tragic fate to finally recant a life consecrated to the clarification of natural occurrences by sinking into the darkness of mysticism. At most, I want rather to plunge down into its depths in order to lift as much of its solid foundation as possible into the light, to free hitherto occult things from mysticism, not to hide things that have already been illuminated behind a mystic veil. That is my goal and task. He came up with a marvelous theory that we have inherited more as synchronicity through the eyes of Jung and Pauli. But it's very different. Uh, Jung calls synchronicity a causal, And that's exactly what Kammerer said it was not. He said it was absolutely worked according to the normal laws of nature. That when some, some strange combination of events, phone calls, weird things happen, there's a reason for it. It's not random. And it's not a causal. It happens for a reason, but you can't see the reason. It's a fairly simple approach. And he did that, took that approach, by going in a very structural manner, but also giving credit to human beings for understanding uh, intuitively that there's something going on somewhere when you don't have all the facts in. When we study things on a cosmological scale, we can't get up there to do anything about it, so we have to do it mostly with mathematics. And when we're studying stuff at a quantum scale, we can't really get at it in a way that is reliable, so we have to study it in a mathematical kind of scale. When we study things on what would be considered the meso scale, our scale, uh, we have developed the scientific method of 
eliminating almost everything except a couple of things we want to study, isolating it into a laboratory situation. However, lately we have become to understand that much of what we need to know cannot be taken into the laboratory. It's here, around us, that we need to study. And there became a, an awareness that we may not necessarily be able to make the experiment, we may be inside the experiment. And when I read what Kammerer had done, I said, until somebody goes back and translates this and understands what he did, he's the first, first person to take a rational view of this. David DeBob, who was a translator and has a great background in philosophy and mathematics and physics, and he read it, first it didn't seem to make any sense, but Bob kept coming back and saying, wow, there's all kinds of weird things in here that really suggest modern stuff. And we would start going through together over the early translations, and we say, God, that looks just like chaos theory. And we come across another passage and say, that looks just like complexity theory. And in fact, it was. It was the, his original dreamings that the universe was organized in a way in which so much information is being hidden that's still there, that we, as in chaos theory now, we admit there's all kinds of information we can't see. Uh, whereas before, anything you couldn't see was considered to be random. What Kammerer did was suggest that none of it's random. And he did it in a sort of stepwise fashion. Uh, there's all kinds of things going in and out of our meso scale here that we can't really see. We'll see something for a while or hear something for a while. For instance, we can only hear in a certain range. And you hit a, a, a tone on a musical instrument, and you can hear that. You can hear most of it. You hit another tone on it, and they'll come beat together, creating tones that we can't hear. So part of what we've just done has disappeared from our consciousness. It's happening. We're even creating it, but it's gone, and we can't see it. And the same thing is true with our bandwidth of light. Also, our bandwidth of complexity. We can see something. We can keep our eyes on a number of things happening, how they're happening all together, until there's a certain point when the complexity loses us and we can't see it. It's still happening. But it's gone beyond our bandwidth of perception. And this is a great deal to do with what chaos theory is about, that all of a sudden we discovered that there are now newer mathematical ways of recovering a lot of what's outside of our bandwidth of perception. The first principle he called persistence. Kammerer proposed that it doesn't happen with just individual physical objects. It happens with systems, combinations of what he called uh, complexes of bodies and forces which is a system. It can be anything from uh, a machine, a, a, a motor, it can be uh, a bunch of people at a table who are all talking about the same uh, subject. Uh, it can be a boat, a business, uh, any kind of thing that works as one piece and tends to be uh, recursive, tends to support itself. And that that tends, just like a physical object, to persist in what it's doing. So what you've done is step the basic Newtonian inertial law up to the level of systems, systems analysis. This is now no longer new, but this was back in 1919. And this persistence tends to go on until it hits something that breaks up the system. And then the parts of the system, all reflecting each other because they've been there uh, and working as the parts of each other, carry the same vectors off and perhaps they vanish entirely out of our bandwidth. We don't see them anymore, but they're still going. Oh, and, the, and the reflection within the environment is still going. And then perhaps down the line, a year, two years, these same forces in motion, in pieces, surface, and two amazing coincidences take place. 